Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So uh, we're going to be looking very briefly at the question of uh, what Islamic scripture might have to say about female scholarship. You'll notice there's something in parentheses there as well. Um, this is a subject that could be discussed from uh, the perspectives of various schools of thought or interpretations, but I don't think overall the dynamics or the underlying issues are particularly different, um, although the sort of the way these issues manifest may be different. So for example, if someone's looking for a scholarly example, I think generally in the Sunni tradition, there's more of a tendency to highlight the wives uh, of the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him and his family, or the female companions. And among the Shi'is, there's more of a tendency to highlight uh, Hazrat Fatima or someone like Fatima Masuma, uh, who came later. But still, the idea is presenting someone who's part of sacred, sacred history as an example of scholarship. Conversely, the objections tend to be the same. So for example, if we want to talk about a female scholar leading prayer for men, I'm not going there, by the way, but you know, the objections tend to be the same. You know, it's inappropriate and immodest and so forth. Uh, and that, but the exact way this is discussed uh, will vary uh, from school of thought to school of thought and generation to generation and so forth. Uh, so uh, I'm largely going to be posing more questions than making statements. Uh, we don't really have the opportunity to discuss all these questions right now, so maybe we can discuss some of them a bit later. Uh, you'll notice a question here, and is scholarship the issue? And it should be patently obvious that it is not. Uh, first of all, because we have had quite a lot of female scholars in Islamic history, whether you want to talk about religious scholars per se, or just scientists, astronomers, poets, etc. Especially in the classical period, um, there are a couple drop-off points for that in our history, uh, which I think are worth uh, pondering about. I was talking about a bit to the TV people. Uh, but the first is in the generation of the companions, there's a bit more in terms of female participation, and then there's a, a sort of drop-off, like in terms of hadith narrators. Not a full drop-off, because you still have uh, female narrators and scholars and so forth, but th there is a shift towards a bit more of a patriarchal focus, if you will. And then from what you can call loosely the classical period uh, into what we can loosely call modernity, there is a sort of second drop off with, which uh, I would personally suspect has to do with an overall sort of uh, defensiveness with respect to preserving Muslim identity in the face of uh, cultural and political threats. And part of that is uh, reinforcing gender roles, which oftentimes manifests as keeping women in their place and keeping men in charge because it would be dreadfully westernized and un-Islamic to have women in charge. <laughs> This could get very weird. But my point being, scholarship is not the main issue. And someone who's engaging in some sort of obscure scholarship on their own is not really going to be bothered and is not a threat. Like if I go home and do scholarship on rare butterflies and I've got a 20,000 page treatise, uh, some people might say that that's odd, but then they might say it's admirable or it's interesting. But unless this somehow becomes a socially prominent issue, it's a non-issue. That No one has a problem with scholarship. We have authority and as, as the problem. And as uh, I think many of us would agree, one of the primary forms, although not the only way authority is expressed among Muslims, regardless of sect, is through uh, a claim to knowledge. So if I wish to exert my authority over you, it's my authority is contingent on my ability to back it up through some sort of uh, agreed learning pertaining to our sources, or at least to give the illusion of that. Uh, so this leads to a couple thoughts that I wanted to reflect on, um, which are not only pertinent to female authority, but they are, of course, permanent to that, per per pertinent to that, and also to female scholarship, uh, because I don't think we really self-reflect that often on what constitutes an authority figure in the Islamic tradition, which may in part be due to the simple fact that we don't have formalized ordination in Islam. Uh, some people do argue that uh, 12 or Shi'is in particular do have a bit more of a hierarchical system. And I would agree that that is there uh, to some degree, but it's still not the same thing as ordinating a priest. And there's still um, a, a lot of uh, leeway uh, and there's a lot of dynamics which go on with, with respect to deciding who and is, who is and is not an authority, whether they be male or female. So you can think about this for a bit. Um, what is an authority in Islam? I think the first two things that will tend to come to mind, perhaps three things, is the imam of the mosque, so, so a prayer leader uh, who's in that 
taking on that formal role. Um, maybe someone giving fatwas, um, and that would be a knowledge-based sort of role, so, so the scholar as the authority, uh, and perhaps uh, a uh, religiously sanctioned political authority, so the khalifa, for example, um, which I don't think usually comes up as much in these discussions. Uh, but these are some reflections on what constitutes authority of varying types, all of which do occur in the Muslim world. Now, as you ponder what these things could mean, uh, you will notice there are two variants of authority that are being represented here. Uh, one is voluntary authority, uh, and one is involuntary or authority or coercion. That is to say, um, you may feel coerced to be here right now, but you're all free to leave and the police aren't going to arrest you. So there is something voluntary going on in this back and forth exchange, uh, and perhaps some perceived benefit on your part to being here, whether it's because of me personally or something else about the gathering or whatever, the, the food, the tea. Um, but it is a voluntary choice. But as we all know, especially in uh, this day and age, uh, a lot of th authority is coercive. Uh, so, you know, you, you have people voluntarily flocking around a uh, inspirational spiritual or religious leader, whether they are uh, using that platform for good or for otherwise. In our focus group, we did point out a little bit that some people do sometimes inflame sectarian tensions uh, to get popularity. Uh, but in any case, someone who ideally is inspiring the people, you know, that, that's a sort of voluntary attracting people towards you. You know, you have people who will go to someone uh, who they uh, feel they attain some benefit from, wisdom, spirituality, guidance, etc. Uh, tradition is kind of, you know, iffy, but people are accepted or not accepted as authorities um, due to the, uh, you know, the, the heritage or, or the, the legacy of tradition. Uh, and this is definitely one of the ways where the female aside comes in, because while there is nothing in Islamic scriptural sources that very specifically identifies an authority figure as male, I would say for the most part, the mental picture of authority Muslims tend to have is a male. And oftentimes that's cultural specific. So it might be a male of a certain ethnicity or a male with a certain type of clothing, etc. cetera. Uh, and if you, even you bring a different male face, there will be a sort of um, you know, disconnect. That person may not be recognized as readily as an authority. And generally women don't fit into that. But even then, there's going to be a sliding scale of women. Women who wear certain types of clothing, for example, may be perceived as more uh, authoritative from a religious perspective or so on and so forth. Uh, but tradition uh, is a source of authority, which we all plug into and we all respond to. Then you have coercive authority, which, as we know, is not somehow separate from Islam. I, I think it's worth um, sort of reminding ourselves of the obvious that in Generally, in the West, uh, adherence to Sharia is, tends to be voluntary. I mean, I mean, there may be social pressures and so forth, but by and large, it's not enforced by the state. Uh, whereas in much of the world, uh, it is enforced. No, okay, that's actually quite wrong. In some of the world, it is enforced by the state and is also a matter of uh, coercion, for, for good or for bad. I'm just pointing out <coughs> we're, ta we're having a different discussion to some degree if one is choosing to follow an authority or whether it's a state-selected or state-sponsored authority. Uh, hell is an interesting thing um, because you could argue is the threat of hell, which is one of the main um, sort of pushes of the exertion of Islamic authority and indeed one of the main issues that also comes up around women being authorities, such as are women going to lead men to hell? Is, is a woman going to go to hell if she follows her own fatwas? Are you going to go to hell if you follow my fatwas, etc.? Um, <coughs> yeah, that's something that many people have considered uh, outside of this room. You know, but if I am, you know, basically putting hell out there, um, is that a form of coercion? Uh, and to what degree do, do I have the right to do that? You know, which leads to the question of God. Uh, I, I would say among the things that unite Muslims, probably the most basic thing is that uh, Allah is the central authority or the ultimate authority. And you know, as a Muslim, I would say completely that Allah is, has the uh, absolute authority over creation. And if Allah wishes me to drop dead right now, that's it. Um, but of course, when we speak on behalf, behalf of Allah, 
there is a lot of translation that goes on, uh, and I can tell you Allah wills this, Allah will send you to hell for this, and etc. Um, but at what point does that transfer into human authority? Oh dear, this is getting into heresy. So it is worth thinking about, uh, and definitely at least uh, in some circles and some understandings of Islam, um, the unwillingness of some women to take authority over themselves in some matters is directly due to the belief that they will go to hell if they don't obey certain people or certain uh, strictures, etc. I'm not passing judgment on that or making a statement. I'm just pointing out that that is there, whether it is right in every case or <coughs> not. Although, I'm trying to decide whether I should digress. It, it comes up a lot in things that really have nothing to do with uh, Islamic scholarship, uh, you know, family law or family relations is, is something, divorce and so on and so forth, which they, they shouldn't necessarily be issues of am I going to go to hell if I get a divorce, but it's somehow there sometimes in the discussion. So yes, who decides who gets to be an authority? Um, because when we have a discussion about are women allowed to be Islamic scholars or Islamic authorities, <coughs> Uh, that presupposes that someone out there has the right to make that decision for women, which I guess generally that would be men. Um, but that question in and of itself uh, is a bit flawed uh, because that does put the woman in a position of an object. Indeed, any discussion about what women are allowed to do uh, is somewhat flawed. But I'd also like to point out that we do not always follow the same procedures for deciding um, who gets to be an authority, so to speak. And these are some different uh, phenomena that occur with both men and women. You know, so while some people sometimes like to generalize that Sunni Islam is, I, I know, is democratic and Shi Islam is not, there is still very much a selection by the masses with respect to who is actually followed as an authority, because this is how life works. Uh, although Sheikh Hamza Yusuf does not identify as Shi, nonetheless, People choosing to watch your videos, share them and like them, is a me means of advocating someone's authority. Uh, attending a teacher or a scholar, attending their lectures, reading their books, um, is a way that the masses uh, determine authority. Uh, attending a prayer, attending a session, these are all for, the largest uh, for a large part uh, informal uh, phenomena that aren't, um, unless people are being a bit dodgy, but they're not pre-planned, um, but it is an emergence of authority. Uh, then you have authority through lineage, you know, Sufi lineage or claims to certain lineage, uh, institutional authority, which by and large tends to be uh, mostly male-centered, whether it be, you know, places like Al-Azhar or the Shi'i Hausa, not entirely, but largely <coughs> state-sponsored authority, um, which can work both to put women in positions of religious authority, sometimes with a certain agenda. You know, for example, some places say they do it to try to decrease radicalism uh, and keeping women out of certain positions, uh, such as religious judges. And then we have uh, coercion, which, uh, although I didn't put it there, uh, for women, sometimes the first uh, barrier to authority, if that's a life position they might otherwise have is, is in the family. That basically, you know, either the husband saying no or the family saying this is Abe and you can't go out in public and do this or we don't want you doing something outside of the house. You know, so that's one level of coercion and then there are others. Um, so these are some thoughts uh, which uh, actually have not even gotten to scripture. Um, however, insofar as the question of whether or not women can be uh, authorities or exert scholarly authority is not essentially a scriptural question because there have been uh, female scholars throughout Islamic history. Um, that in and of itself is not a question heavily rooted in scripture, although the question of female authority can be continued uh, from the perspective of Quran, Hadith, and interpretations thereof. Uh, so I look forward to part two of this. <laughs>